Great. Okay, well, brilliant. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Obviously, we know how busy you are. Um, and it's Thank really you. great for us to, you know, for Rope to, to get to meet you finally. We obviously all read and know your work. So I just wanted to begin really by um, getting you to introduce yourself to Rope and, and our readers and activists, and particularly those in Africa, because we do get a lot of African comrades who uh, come onto the website and stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm an associate professor of human ecology at Lund University. I have a background on the radical, mostly extra parliamentary left in Sweden. Um, since 99, I think in 1997, I started gravitating from anarcho syndicalism to uh, the fourth international kind Trotskyism. And uh, that's that is still my formal political affiliation, although I'm extremely passive. I'm to I'm a totally passive member of the Swedish section. Uh, I try to combine activism and uh, scholarship. It's a fine balance to tread, as you know. Yeah, yeah. My my engagement with Africa um, specifically. So I started becoming politically active in. 93 94 so just at the tail end of the south africa solidarity movement uh, um, i was very fascinated for a time in the in the early 90s by the struggles in mozambique and angola and solidarity with with southern africa i've never been to southern africa my the the only part of the continent that i've had a continuous engagement with is egypt okay uh, i mean i've been to morocco as well but egypt is the part of the continent that where I've done research and where I've uh, visited reasonably regularly over the past decade. Uh, I was just there for a month. Um, and I, I actually published a paper in, in Rope uh, oh, okay. on, on, uh, uh, on climate impacts on fisher folk in uh, northern uh, Egypt. Oh, okay. uh, but that's almost 10 years ago, I think, or probably is 10 years. Yeah, something like 10 years ago. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, does that service and yeah. introduction yeah yeah no that's really helpful that's great okay and, so, and then I, I wanted to really use your uh, work in, in fossil capitalism yeah and sort of to try and make sure we kind of got a, a fair summary of it and then to get use that to talk a little bit about the africa of the global south so i mean obviously in the book you talked about how there was the 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 expression of concentrating or the desire, as you say, to concentrate industry in cities and, and as we've said, to mm -hmm. avoid the complex engineering to sustain water power production. And so that meant a greater concentration of labour, of course, that could mm -hmm. be disciplined and exploited. And so I think the important point that really jumps out is that, is that you know, for you and, and for ourselves, it's capitalism, you know, yeah. not human beings that are the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's capitalism capitalism that's driving rapid climate change and industrialization which i think is emphasized by a lot of climate activists historically mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. as being the problem isn't as much as a problem for us now some might say that we might have sort of you know turned capitalism into a thing and it is there's humans behind capitalism but i mean is that kind of some of the crux of what you, you you're trying to argue in the book yeah 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 absolutely yes i mean the book the book is in a uh, as you know it's in a historical investigation of uh, the transition from water to steam in Britain. So a, a moment when fossil, large scale fossil fuel combustion became integral to uh, to com capitalist commodity production. And it's very it's very hard to say that it's very difficult to say that or to argue that humanity as such was responsible for this shift. Rather, it was very specifically capitalist dynamics that propelled this shift. Now, that's a historical argument, but you can, of course, look at it uh, and see similar things in the present. So I don't know if you saw the, the report that The Guardian put out yesterday about how the big fossil fuel companies are planning to set off uh, giant carbon bombs by investing in further extraction of uh, oil and gas and how that will shatter all the remaining uh, carbon budgets for staying below 1.5 degrees and, and yeah, take us... Uh, deep into uh, uh, disastrous territory where we're, we're essentially already there. But this process that we see unfolding right now where these companies are drowning in windfall profits and reinvesting them into more fossil fuel extraction, 
everything from fossil gas in uh, Mozambique to the uh, East Africa crude oil pipeline that Total is building in Tanzania and Uganda to ExxonMobil um, outside of the of, of Guyana to to expansion in Norway and so on and so forth. The, this process of compulsive reinvestment of windfall profits in uh, in the expansion of uh, fossil fuel extraction is not, I would say, a process that you can equate with humanity as such, because yeah. it's it's not determined by humanity in any kind of democratic fashion. Yeah. It's not a it's not an um, it's not a result of some sort of innate disposition of our species. Humans have lived in so many other yeah. ways throughout history. It's it's not something that humanity as a whole is a party to. It's a very specific class, or even just a fraction of a, of a class that is presiding over this process and doing it in accordance with the uh, mandate to accumulate capital. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, it, it, this is not to say that that uh, the any the, the the only environmentally destructive mode of production that we've had in history is capitalism. Very very uh, uh, very emphatically not so. I'm I'm currently doing nerdy historical work on uh, environmental degradation in feudal Europe, and it's clear that feudalism was environmentally destructive too, notably to to forests in Europe. Yeah. Uh, but. Uh, 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 capitalism is by far the most <laughs> destructive mode of production we've had when it comes to uh, fossil fuel uh, production, and it's the problem that we're we're facing right now. We're not dealing with Stalinism. We're not dealing with feudalism. We're dealing with a, a capitalism that is careening completely out of control in terms of its uh, its compulsive fossil fuel extraction and expansion. Sure, I mean you touched on. You know, um, humans have lived in different forms before, so it points to the idea of alternatives. And obviously, with our our interest in Africa and the global South, I mean, there has yeah. been writers like Samir Amin and others who've, who've yeah. talked about the only way for them to pursue an independence is a form of of delinking. And there has been attempts at that. You know, famously, sort of Ghana's early t um, mm. attempts at building an autonomous sort of um, mm -hmm. steel mm -hmm. industry, okay, which didn't work. But but I mean, based on that idea, I mean. And given how bad the climate crisis is, you know, what way can you sort of see a, a, an alternative political and economic development for Africa or the global south? Yeah, well, I, I have to say that my expertise is limited here, but uh, if, if you look at North Africa, which is the only region that I can say something about with some claim to more than superficial knowledge, Northern Africa, including a country like Egypt, um, has a special position in this problem. And um, it, it, the, the peculiarities of a country like Egypt, and to an extent Algeria as well, uh, is that these countries are hyper vulnerable to the climate crisis. Yeah, I, I will restrict myself to Egypt too. Hyper vulnerable with sea level rise already being very destructive to the Nile Delta and will be so much more in the coming decades. Um, the heat waves uh, in Cairo in the summer are uh, worsening and uh, temperature rise will be extremely destructive to agriculture in Upper Egypt as well. And these are just some of the impacts. Sure. Uh, at the same time, the Egyptian economy is totally integrated in um, uh, the, the MENA capitalist system, Middle East, North Africa capitalist order that is fundamentally based on, on fossil fuels. And after the counter-revolution and with the rise of the Sisi dictatorship, this is more so than ever, where, where economic growth in Egypt is completely predicated on constant injection of capital from the Gulf. Uh, at the same time, Egypt has an absolutely enormous capacity or potential for renewable energy with uh, uh, both solar and wind potential in Egypt being, I would say, I mean, probably, I mean, I don't have the figures, but probably sufficient to <laughs> supply the energy needs for, for much of the African continent. I mean, uh, there is so much land that is very, very thinly used in the Sahara Desert outside of the Nile Valley 
where uh, solar uh, radiation is very strong and could be harvested at low cost. And you have tremendous wind sources as well in, uh, in very many locations in Egypt. But these potentials are virtually completely squandered because this, the CC dictatorship is not interested in, in pursuing this kind of development. Mm -hmm. Morocco is different because Morocco is a world leader in, in, uh, in centralized solar power. And uh, uh, that is partly because the Moroccan dictatorship has another uh, situation when it comes to energy and has sort of positioned itself as a, a vanguard for solar power in Africa and, and sort of banked on this being a, a, a future source of revenue where Morocco is going to export the solar power uh, knowledge and skills and potentially technology to other parts of Africa as well. Uh, I, I My general conclusion here would be that countries such as Egypt, and of course you could say the same thing about Iraq and, and other parts in, in the Middle East, but let's stay on the African continent, need to get out of fossil fuels and detach themselves and their, their economic basis from fossil fuels because it's a doomed future and it's completely unsustainable to keep this kind of, of uh, economic growth that you're seeing in Egypt right now dependent on oil and gas sales from the Gulf, which is what you have. I mean, it's it's all predicated on fossil capital from the Gulf. Uh, uh, that's that's environmentally unsustainable, but it's economically unsustainable also because the, what, what you're having in Egypt now is, is a continuous construction boom where the CC regime is is overseeing, you know, the construction of entire new cities, new uh, a new capital, new replicas of, of, of virtually all the major cities in uh, in Egypt and an insane, an insane frenzy of construction of highways and malls and things like that, that is a way to artificially keep the economy going uh, by the injection of capital from the Gulf so as to maintain some sort of a level of acquiescence, if not support for the CISA government. It's economically unsustainable as well. It can't, can't last forever. It's a, it's a building boom that just cannot go on forever. Mm -hmm. And a sort of reordering of the, of the Egyptian uh, economic development into something that's socially and environmentally sustainable would be more, uh, well, it would have to be delinked from the Gulf and it would have to be based on renewable energy. And mm -hmm. thankfully, Egypt has absolutely, <laughs> well, virtually endless, potentials for renewable energy development, such as, uh, as does Morocco and Algeria mm. and uh, a country like Iraq as well. And I'm sure you can find that in, in other parts of Africa, including Sub-Saharan Africa, that I'm, uh, I'm not as familiar with. Although, of course, the, the desert, the, the Sahara Desert, is a special, is a key resource here uh, when it comes to solar power. Yeah. 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 So there's definitely, we can see through that, you know, the basis for at least a pan-Africanism in terms of driving something towards a more sustainable fossil free future without absolutely without. i mean i mean i would i would imagine that you could i mean there there have been you know discussions about a european grid so an integrated uh, uh, power grid for the european continent i'm sure you could uh, think of something similar for the african continent where obviously the sahara could serve as a powerhouse uh, but uh, complement that with uh, with uh, wind power and <laughs> stop the expansion of destructive hydropower such as the, the various dams uh, constructed on the on the on the lower nile and things like that yes. uh, but an, an integrated grid of this kind has the great advantage that you know when 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 the sun goes out uh, you have perhaps wind very active in another place and you can smooth out any kind of fluctuations sure. by a, a large continental integration yeah. I, I should I should point out that I don't know the level of I mean where the debate on these things sure. are where they sure. sit on a on a major on a, on an African scale generally I just have some yeah. impressions from from uh, from Egypt and to an extent Morocco yeah yeah know. I mean the point the point in raising this is to get that debate on the agenda yeah you know, yeah certainly yeah. the mainstream because you know it's not really there at the moment yeah. so if it sure. is you've got German multinationals getting in there first which of course yeah. they have yeah, interest yeah, yeah. in really serving Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. pumping it back to Europe. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah great. Yeah. I mean, so look, we can't not mention um, the impact of the pandemic, and of course, you've tried to capture that connection between climate and and Corona in your book, Corona Climate, Chronic Emergency, War, Communism in the Twenty First Century. And I just want to quote you quote you here. Um, a lovely quote where you say, uh, 
the grotesque concentration of resources for burning at the top of the human pyramid is a scourge for all living beings. An effective climate policy will be the total expropriation of the top one to 10%. Now, reading that, I can feel and hear your dislike, to put it mildly, uh, at those who you know support the status quo, who kind of shrug the shoulders, if you like, of what's going on. And often that tends to be, you know, academics, policy, policy makers who are happily sat at the top of the pyramid, often in the global north, but, but not always. And, and you're drawing our attention to that connection between the pandemic and the consequences and sort of how it's uh, linked to the environment and the zoonotic spillover, how we, or how capitalism is, you know, bashing its way through the environment and releasing these pathogens, which, you know, we're all now paying the price for. Um, and of course, in the pandemic, we could see how the Northern governments and, and any intervention they made was really just, you know, trying to preserve the status quo, shoring up the existing political economy, you know, we, you know the, through the role of the World Trade Organization or the European Union. And in fact, we've seen, you know, the wealth of billionaires and others increase in the pandemic. Can you say something about, or your thoughts on how there were sort of limited global interventions that um, really didn't do much about changing that and how the sort of existing political economy as, as sort of embedded and, uh, and sort of further entrenched existing sort uh -huh. of power relations and how that's impacted on Africa? Yeah, so, mm, I mean, my my first observation would be that 2020 presented the world with an opportunity to mm. discuss and potentially deal with the drivers of zoonotic diseases. And these drivers are primarily deforestation in the tropics, uh, global warming itself. There's a, a new paper that just came out in Nature, I think it was, that showed just how many viruses we can expect in a warming world yeah. when animal populations migrate and bump into human population centers they haven't been in contact with before and shed their viruses and wildlife trading uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, the, uh, this opportunity was completely squandered in the sense that all eyes were fixed on the holy grail of vaccines and other kinds of measures for combating the symptoms of COVID-19, but uh, the drivers were left to... <laughs> accelerate and deforestation in the tropics remarkably hit the third highest level uh, ever recorded in 2020. So it, it spiked in the year of the pandemic and it, it is continuing to spike. Now that trend is not primarily located in, in Africa, although you see it in, in the Congolese rainforest as well, but it's driven above all by the Bolsonaro government in, in the Amazon. That's where the the acceleration of deforestation is most destructive. So it's it's very ideologically and politically driven by a far right government that is giving free reign to these uh, 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 ranchers and other <laughs> sort of semi colonial entrepreneurs to to cut down the forests in the Amazon. Um, and of course, nothing's been done about global warming. It's just it's just speeding on. Uh, this, I mean, this obviously will come back to haunt uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or Northern Africa for that matter too. Um, and uh, tropical deforestation in, in Sub-Saharan Af Africa needs to be brought under control and, and, uh, and uh, in the best case reversed. Um, but I'm, I really should defer to others to pronounce on these matters because my knowledge of, of yeah. the of the problems of tropical deforestation and their drivers and potential cures in sub-Saharan Africa is very limited. Yeah. Sure, sure, no problem. Okay, so I mean, you mentioned early on, obviously, that you've been drawn to um, Marxism and Marxist writings uh, and the sort of Marxist left. Can you just tell us a little bit about how Marxist writing has influenced your work and your understanding of the ecology of capitalism? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh I, I i it goes so back deep so so deep back into my teenage years reading mark so it's it's hard to say how it has i mean i don't know where i would be without reading marx and marx's work i i started reading marxist ecology more specifically in the summer of 2006 or in the in the year of 2006 yeah 
Uh, and uh, of course, I, I read the work of what's sometimes referred to as the second generation of ecological Marxists. So John Bellamy Foster and Paul Burkett and these, these yeah. people who demonstrated quite convincingly that there is a streak of um, ecological consciousness and quite advanced ecological critique of capitalism in the works of Marx and Engels themselves. And that there is a tradition that has been sometimes subterranean, sometimes uh, overt and out in the open ever since then. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, recently I have sort of lost interest a little bit in the kind of exegetic side of this, you know, trying to prove that uh, uh, ev every word or most words that Marx uh, sure. put on paper had ecological insights or that all ecological insights we need are to be found already in Marx, uh, yeah. sort of tendencies that you can find some sometimes in this in this argument. And I, I've, uh, I think that we need, I mean, it's currently the, the sort of Marxist tradition that I'm mostly inspired by is that of the uh, very far from African concerns, unfortunately, uh, the Frankfurt School and Adorno and, uh, and uh, uh, a, a kind of critical theory that also engages with psychoanalysis, which I think is uh, uh, an extremely important resource for dealing with trends in the present. Um, yeah, that's the kind of, of Marxist tradition that I mostly engage with sure. right now. Yeah. Okay, and, and sort of on that theme of, of of the Marxist writers who you know may have wrote differently from from some others. I mean, obviously, you know, Walter Rodney is is, is important. There's a, a real resurgence in the interest of what Rodney, and as you know, Leo's written a, a brilliant yeah. book about yeah. Rodney as well, and, and and himself, you know, in his in his sort of uh, path breaking book, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Rodney yeah. himself talks about how, you know, when the colonialists started upsetting the topsoil, the result was disastrous. So, I mean, there is those traditions there as well. Sure, sure, sure. Um, you find um, similar things in Fanon as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And a, a lot of this is, I think, needs to be on earth, no, no pun intended. But absolutely. I mean, is, was it a, have you been influenced by any sort of writers that have been marginalized, like, uh, you know, Rodney uh, in the Global South? Or I'm, very, I'm very weak on Rodney. I'm very weak on Rodney. And uh, uh, I mean, I've read I've read uh, Fanon quite uh, extensively, and, and of course we we wrote the book uh, me and the Setkin Collective, which I'm a member of, the uh, White Skin Black Feud on the Danger yeah. of Postal Fascism, yeah. which yeah, the, where, where the title is of course uh, yet another <laughs> twist yeah. on on Fanon's <laughs> famous yeah, yeah famous title, but where we also try to engage with that sort of tradition, um, um, including quite a bit of I think I mean. Yeah, my, my own personal engagement with the Global South is limited to the Middle East and the Caribbean. Sure. Uh, sure. And uh, there is a, a very rich tradition of, uh, uh, you know, anti-colonial, decolonial thinking in the Caribbean that has quite often a pretty strong uh, environmental dimension or aspect to it um and i've yeah i've i've dabbled a little bit in research on on the maroons and uh, other types of, of resistance to slavery uh, and afro-caribbean um, thinking coming out of that experience uh, there there is a great deal there to be unearthed and i'm i'm happy to say that the research on marinage and uh, ecology as well in the Caribbean is very productive, it seems to me right now. There's so much, so many new books coming out on Marinage uh, and uh, uh, Caribbean ecology. And um, uh, obviously this, this isn't, this is the African diaspora, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's uh, uh, if, I mean, it's inextricably linked historically and to an extent in the present as well with, with African politics and culture and, and intellectual currents. Uh, uh, yeah, and there is, you know, there is this misconception that environmental concerns, including appreciation of wild nature, uh, has its origins among white people in the in the in the global north. Uh, <laughs> that that misperception is just a result of the fact that it's. It's white people in the in the global north that have over the past centuries written most of the books and you know been in control of ideology production. But there is a fabulously rich tradition of subaltern mm -hmm. um, environmentalism uh, in the Caribbean and in the rest of the global south. And I think 
I mean, personally, I'm more interested in trying to give a little bit of a contribution to recovering that tradition than, yeah. than working more on uh, the writings of Marx and Engels or indeed, uh, uh, yeah, some of their followers. So uh, if, in, in my own work, yeah, I'm, I'm planning to write quite extensively on marinage and ecology uh, in, in, uh, in the Caribbean primarily. And I'm also... <laughs> Working a little bit, although the, I mean this is perhaps tangentially related to these these problems, but in Egypt again there is a, a an extremely long tradition of uh, peasants fleeing uh, exploitation and running off, either uh, into the delta when that was possible, or even in, uh, out into the desert and trying to survive, or or into the cities. And an Egyptian um, PhD student of mine and myself are we're trying to. Uh, or we're aiming to to write a sort of five thousand year history of this tradition of uh, of anachoriasis, as it was referred to in ancient times, tasahub in the Arabic period. So uh, peasants seeing uncontrolled spaces of nature as refuges for themselves, places to get away from exploitation. A bit similar to to marinage in in the Caribbean. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, obviously, we cover lots of that in our. Our journal and the website about yes, you know yes. African traditions of of uh, you know fighting uh, all sorts of uh, oppressions and exploitation yes. and extractivism. So yeah, yes. and the website's full of stuff like that. We want yes. to get more on it. Yes. Well, listen, uh, last couple of questions. So yes. um, first one, really, you mentioned uh, the book White Skin Black Fuel, and you mentioned the far right, and in in that book you talk about how there's a kind of death wish behind fascism, and uh, it's reinforced by capital's inability to see a future without its own dominance in the world. Um, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more behind your discussion of how the far right reacts to and grows in a climate of, uh, you know, in the context of a climate emergency. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so that book, which is a very big book, is an attempt to deal with a quite contradictory and overdetermined and multifaceted phenomenon, namely the far right in the climate crisis. And... Uh, uh, there are many ways in which the far right, so to speak, channels various types of political or, or psychic investments into uh, business as usual, into the status quo, and give vent to these investments in more in a more aggressive fashion. So, for instance, uh, I think. In the, as the climate crisis deepens, it, it's very apparent that we are talking about mass suffering in the global south. And uh, that, that mass suffering is, of course, approaching Europe's borders every now and then when you have uh, so-called waves of, of migrants uh, seeking safety. And the far right sort of uh, epitomizes callousness or indifference towards the suffering, the let them drown approach that is necessary to keep this, this uh, unjust order going. And uh, the far right then, uh, yeah, uh, how should I, the, the far right embodies this feeling of, okay, whatever, whatever suffering uh, that might go on in the global south is their problem. It's not our problem. And they have to uh, deal with that with it as best as, as they can. We have no responsibilities to, to uh, assist these people or, or you know, compensate or, or uh, open our borders or anything like that. And in that sense, the, the, the strengthening of the far right is a logical consequence of the, of, the, of the social order itself as it enters a deeper a deeper climate crisis. Um, now, this is just this is. I mean, I'm what I'm saying here is pretty abstract, and it you know you you would have to go uh, into more concrete detail to see how this works. It's not it's not a it's not a linear trend that the far right is just uh, growing in power all the time. It goes up and down, and uh, you know there are a lot of concrete factors that play into. Mm. Uh, the the ups and downs of far right parties and presidents, uh, but but there seems to be a, a general trend mm. of an increasingly powerful far right and more authoritarian tendencies that go hand in hand, obviously mm. along the borders of of Europe. Uh, yeah, and as as the climate crisis deepens, be it with uh, more extreme uh, rainfall disasters as we've seen in South Africa over the past weeks and months, yeah. or the a totally unprecedented spring heat wave that we've had on the Indian subcontinent yeah. now in, in April and May. 
as these things get even worse, and there, there's no way that they cannot get worse. I mean, that's hardwired into the process of global warming. Mm. Uh, the far right could come to the fore as the the most uh, uh, aggressive defender of the material interests of privileged mm. people in the in the global north. Yeah, yeah, that's one of our arguments in the book. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and you know, the rise of Trump and Bolsonaro uh, yeah. sort of. They, they open that door, don't need to the far right through their climate denialism and their, you know, they're saying that they're going to protect, you know, the, the coal miners in America and, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the, you know, the ranches in, in uh, Brazil and that. Mm -hmm. Okay, just um, a, a last question, really. We'd like to end the, on a question around activism because it's mm -hmm. something that, you know, we're keen to, to give voice to and platform to, particularly of our Afri African comrades. So obviously your book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, has caused a lot of noise um, you know, it's caused a lot of discussion on the left, which is only a good thing. And in the book, you're very critical of, you know, northern movements, you know, um, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which is really big in, in Oxford, where, where I'm based, um, you know, and, and it's just had a, a whole wave of successful sort of protests in, um, in, in the UK in the last few weeks. Um, I was at a meeting of... Um, uh, Insulate Britain in a small town a few miles from Oxford uh, a few weeks ago in, in Wallingford where um, you know um, some of the key speakers were there you know drumming up more support for their direct actions which is about 14 and now in prison. Now you've criticised some of that in the book and you've called for a slightly different type of movement. I just wondered could you talk about how you think that talks that book talks to act activists in Africa? Uh... <clears throat> Uh, I have to, for, first I should say that uh, there is uh, there is a ebook, an ebook that Verso just put out called Property, uh, Property Will Cost Us the Earth, uh, where climate activists from around the world are discussing some of the issues raised in the book and responding to it sometimes as well. Yeah. And there you have uh, some activists, including Vanessa Nakata, probably the most famous uh, African climate activist, and um, mm, people in Mozambique writing about their experiences and, and uh, tactical dilemmas and stuff like that. Um, uh, other, other than that, I don't know if there has been a lot of direct engagement with the book among activists in sub-Saharan Africa that I'm personally aware of. And one critique that could be leveled against the book and that has been leveled against it is that it's based primarily on discussions in the climate movement in the global north. Uh, and that's part of, I mean, that's it's just because I, have, I, I live in, in the global north and that's where I've done my climate activism and, it, and the book came out of the conjuncture of 2019, and it was written in a critical dialogue with uh, the ideas put forth by uh, XR at that time. Although, I mean, I have a, I think XR is moving in a good direction. I think Just yeah, Stop yeah. Oil is a, is, a, is a truly brilliant campaign uh, that we've seen in the UK over the past months. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, so, I mean, I, I don't, I can't say that I'm aware of any reception of the book in, in Sub-Saharan Africa or among climate activists. Uh, there, I, I mean, I, I'd be curious to know, for instance, what climate activists in Uganda would make of the argument. When I was at, at COP26 in Glasgow, I, I saw quite a few uh, very energetic climate activists from Uganda. So that seems to be a, a, a hot spot of climate activism in sub-Saharan Africa for good reason with the ECOP pipeline and, and things like that. Uh, but I'd be interested to, to hear what they make of, of these arguments. And I, d I don't really know. And obviously issues around escalation and moving into militant tactics uh, play out very differently in, in different local contexts. And, you know, the repressive state apparatus works in, in different ways. And there are, there are different local traditions of this kind of struggle uh alive or not in, in in various places uh yeah i'm not i'm not really in a position to to speak about the relevance of the arguments i made in that book for struggles in in sub-saharan africa i mean i draw quite a bit on examples from the egyptian revolution and I, the idea that non-violence is the only path to 
success is seems to me quite hard to square with with what we know of the anti-colonial revolutions in Africa. That quite yeah. quite often, uh, and I mean this goes for India itself as well, yeah. Yeah. In, included aspects of ferocious, even armed struggle. I mean it's it's yeah. very hard for me to try to shoehorn a, something like Angola or Mozambique or or even South Africa, which figures yeah. in my book quite prominently into that model. Uh, so, I mean, as a general historical or, or analytical argument that if you want to, to topple extremely entrenched dominant class interests, you might need to use militant tactics because this is what history shows, then I think you have, a, there's a lot of material for that case from Sub-Saharan Africa and Northern Africa as well, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Algeria, Egypt, whatever, wherever you go. I mean, I, I, I was just thinking about the, there has been some criticism that the idea that you should, uh, you know, uh, blow up anything would certainly uh, in the global north would have people arrested. It would put mm -hmm. them under the lens of the security services. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you've been criticised for, you know, putting people could be potentially putting people in serious trouble if they literally followed those arguments. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, and obviously in, in repressive countries, you know, it, you know, the, the, the danger might be swifter. I mean, we've got comrades from Kenya who, you know, often go around to morgues to, to find the dead bodies of their comrades that are, that are constantly getting assassinated. I mean, so in that sense, is it too dangerous to advocate something like that in, in countries with severe repression? Yeah. Yeah, of course. There is a danger to there is a danger to reckless activism, and that you expose yourself to harm by uh, doing very radical things. But I I find it hard to uh, you know endorse the view that intensity of repression is generally a reason for people to abstain from militant tactics. I mean that that doesn't seem to hold. Here, here, the context I'm most familiar with and the example that I would always draw is Palestine. Yeah. I mean, I don't know any context in the world where you would face more immediate repression when you engage in political struggle than Palestine, but that's precisely why people fight and it's not a reason for them to stop fighting. I mean, look, just look at what's going on in, in Jenin right now. It's 20 years since the destruction of the Jenin refugee camp and I, I happen to be on the site, so I'm, I'm sort of emotionally attached to that place. And you see... 20 years later, this wave of, of resistance coming from the exact same place, you know, yeah. resistance and its, and its radicalism can thrive in, in a context of very serious repression. So the existence of repression in itself is not a reason to say that we need to, to be mellow and gentle and only engage in, in peaceful, nonviolent, not so very harmful Activism. Obviously, you can't apply this Palestine case and just, you know, transport it to, to yeah. the climate front. But uh, the problem of repression is much more complicated than just saying, oh, when people risk risk up exposing themselves to harm and, and, and ending up in jail, they should make sure not to do so. And they're not going to do it. I mean, sometimes very big things are at stake and you have to fight even if you, you risk ending up uh, in the hands of repression. The important thing, of course, is to try to minimize repression and to suffer as little of it as possible sure. and not, not, for instance, uh, uh, making it a virtue to get arrested and stuff like that. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, so on that, just quickly on that idea of not making it a virtue to get arrested, I mean, there has been some reviewers that have, have emphasized the fact that they see that idea of, you know, being more militant is slightly more... They haven't used this word, but elitist or even the worst form of vanguardism. And some reviews of, uh, I think, have, have said, no, actually, what Andreas is saying is more that there's, they both complement each other. There's, there's a room for both. You need a more militant wing of a bigger mass of movement. I mean, which one of those sort of synopsis? Is yeah, both. But, but also, I mean, militant tactics are quite often part of mass political protest as well. I mean, just look at what's been happening in Sri Lanka over the past weeks. Yeah. I mean... Uh, uh, rioting and property destruction can be a very <laughs> popular form of protest and doesn't have to be have, uh, be anything you know elitist or small scale about it or you know local vanguards or whatever yeah. uh, but i do think that there's a room for a diversity of tactics and for many ways of organizing these things and that small groups can do meaningful actions also without necessarily 
being in contradiction with with mass politics and mass action. Okay. I'm I'm afraid I have to uh, run to pick up my daughter. Yeah, no, that's yeah. great. My alarm just went off as well, so yeah. <laughs> it's been an absolutely pleasure meeting you, Andreas. Yeah, so thank, thank you so much. And more. sorry for not being. I mean, I feel uh, like I said, my geographical areas of knowledge are li Middle East and to to limited extent the Caribbean. So I'm not. I don't have much knowledge to share about sub -Saran. No, but, no, but it's great for us to get uh, a diversity of voices on the on the platform uh, and on the on the yeah. site as well that's yeah. great you know what i mean and we'll, and we'll definitely be in touch we really appreciate yeah. your time because we yeah. know you are hectic and stuff yeah. thanks so much comrades okay. keep going okay, journalists wonderful keep going yeah.